Hey folks, it's Ray VC Ramaker.com here. In today, I've got your full review of the new Tax Neo Smart Bike, or Bike Smart as it's uh, technically written down. Uh, now I say new because it's finally actually shipping. This past weekend, the first people in the world actually started receiving these units, and you may be one of them. So it is now out in the wild after two years of product development in, in the public eye anyways. Uh, and that's what it looks like right there. That's the final box of the unit itself. Um, though I've actually been using one for about five months now and testing things and whatnot. Now, obviously this is definitely not sponsored by tax in any way, shape or form. Uh, I just using, and I'm sending this thing back or actually I'll pick it up, I guess, or whatever the case may be. And then I'll probably go get my own for later on, other comparisons and stuff like that. I'm gonna tell you the good, the bad, and uh, the bit of the ugly as well of this bike. Now, when it comes to the box itself, it's somewhat impressive. That box is basically the exact same size as a normal bike box, uh, the ones that you know your bike comes in, except it's a crap ton heavier, about 110 pounds or 50 kilos or so. Uh, so definitely not something about a check on an airplane, but and when it comes to assembly, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you're basically just putting those legs on the frame here and attaching the handlebars, which comes in one piece, attaching the display and putting the seat on and you're done. Uh, I did it I think five different times now, uh, and each time average about 30 minutes, including taking photos and videos. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start in the back of the unit here and work my way all the way to the front, talk about all the different features here, and then we'll jump on it and ride it and all the, the good jazz that you expect. Oh, a quick thing first, if you're finding this video interesting, go ahead and like that like button right now. It really helps with the video and the channel and everything else quite a bit. But first we get the box out of the way because it just seems a little bit like distractingly hanging out there, like it's just waiting for something to happen. Uh, so, with that here, we've got the power cable. Uh, this power cable provides power, not for regular riding, though you can use it that way, and I do use it that way, but actually for the downhill drive simulation of the rear flywheel. So if you go down a hill in Zwift, it'll actually spin the, the wheel forward, um, or at least it should. It doesn't always seem to work well for me, but that's what it's supposed to do anyways, uh, just like past Neo series units. Also, it provides constant power for your tablet up here. There's two USB ports, two amp USB ports um, under the bottom there. And so if you leave this plugged in and that plugged in, then you got power all the time, which is nice. Uh, so that's there. Up here is the flywheel. If I go and just spin this slightly, you see it should kick in there. There we go. Uh, and lights up there, lights up down there, display turns on, uh, basically it's powered up. Uh, and again, you can get all this light stuff if you unplug it, no problem using your pedal-based power. So as you're pedaling, it'll power everything. Continuing to move forward a little bit, you've got the crank arms here. Uh, now the crank arms are pretty unique in a little way because they've got these little pods inside. So you thread your pedals through, any pedal that you want, you put them through there, uh, pops out the other side, and they have these three pods, depending on which orientation you have, are 170 mil, 172.5 millimeters and 175 millimeters. So those three different orientations will give you those three different crank lengths. A little bit different than the Wahoo bike, which has five different crank lengths, but has that like bear paw looking crank arm design. This is a little bit cleaner visually looking, um, but I found it also a little bit more finicky. Um, probably though that may be a me issue because I'm changing pedals so often as I'm testing stuff that I found some nuances there. Up here is one of one, two, three, four adjustment points each with their little rulers right there in centimeters. So you can keep track of those measurements. There isn't any sort of like automated system between different riders. So you can have to kind of write this down and figure this out yourself. But you can go ahead and just simply loosen it like this. You can go up and down. See, I've already forgot what that measurement was. So I'm gonna go with roughly there and then tighten it up. Um, now, this is where things get a little bit funky. The way it works is that you pull out this handle. If you wanna go again, find the lock point, there we go, and then continue going forward. Uh, so the problem is that you can see it hits there, right? And so it's not, it's not super nice. And then when you go like this, now you wanna leave it locked in. So this is kind of sticking out, just looks a little ugly. Practically speaking, you can slide forward and back. Um, you can go ahead and adjust the saddle like normal. You can adjust the tilt. Uh, all the same stuff that you would expect from a saddle rail. It's identical here, you can swap out the saddle. No problems there. Up on the front side here, you got the same kind of concept. You can see right here, this controls the up and down of this entire thing right there. A little tough to do with only one hand. And then up here, this one goes forward and back. If I go the right direction, you can see like that as well. Uh, I haven't had any problems with fit standpoint. For me, I'm six foot two, so I'm fairly tall. The one quirk I have had though, is that I find my the inside of my thighs rub against the seat post right here. Not like enough that it bothers me, um, but it's one of those things that 
maybe if I was doing a two hour ride and I don't know, maybe, but uh, for me, most of my rides about an hour or so in here. Continuing on forward, there's a single water bottle cage here. I guess a little bit strange, there's not a second one, but I guess that gets to my whole like thigh rubbing issue. So that's probably why they don't have it there. Uh, moving forward a bit more, we've got handlebars. Um, so in theory, you can swap out the handlebars. You can go ahead and remove this stuff here and do all that. In practice, I haven't tried that yet. Also, Tax doesn't have any sort of tri bar kit, uh, but these are round handlebars. So you could put clip on bars right there but you might run into issues with width around this. So it depends on how wide your particular setup is. You've got to make the clearance around this display right there. What's important though about these handlebars is the different shifting buttons and brakes. Shifting wise, there are two buttons right here, big one and a small one. Uh, they go ahead and allow shifting of your basically virtual rear cassette. So if you imagine a bike is here, your cassette would normally be there and your virtual chain rings in the front. And you can configure those via the application. So using a tax utility app, you can configure a couple things. One is your chain ring setup. So you can do like a single, double, or triple. You can set up the chain rings as well as the cassettes in the back. It's not quite as clean as the, the Wahoo bike setup, but it gets the job done. It's, it's all right there. Uh, and that will go ahead and then show up up here on the display where you'll see that particular chain ring setup and cassette setup. The other thing you can configure within the app is the fan intensity. So these two fans up here that we'll get to in a second, you can configure that there. And you can configure the power averaging of the display itself, like three second averaging, five second averaging, 10 second averaging, as well as do some testing and turning on and off the road feel um, of the flywheel. So that allows you to replicate things like cobblestones and bricks and all that kind of stuff using the same tax neo functionality that's been there for a couple of years. There is this little tray table right here where you can put things. Uh, I put lots of things there over the course of a while. It does have a rubber insert though you can peel out, which is kind of nice because if you spill things there, like if you have gels out of there and they get all goopy, it's no big deal to pull this out. Probably stick it in your dishwasher and you're good to go. Next, there are two fans up here. Um, yeah, there's two fans. They're not they're not awesome fans. They're not horrible fans. In fact, I would say Tax is doing themselves a disservice because these fans actually have three settings, low, medium, and high. They ship in a medium setting by default, which is pretty crappy. The high setting is a substantial bump up in intensity. Um, so go ahead and in the app there, just choose the high setting, and that does uh, provide a fair bit more breeze. It is just kind of like a gentle breeze. You'll see I still have two fans down there for actual cooling. Up here is the tablet uh, holder. Uh, also, by the way, on the fans themselves, you can remove the entire fan contraption and just use the small little display holder. It's a secondary piece there that's in the box so you don't have to have the fans if you don't want them. Up here is a tablet display holder. I have an iPad there and use this little thing right here to just simply lock on, pull it in. I've had zero problems whatsoever. You can adjust the length of this down there. Um, in the back here are two cables for the fans and one cable that you see just loosey goosey down there um, for the display itself. Personally, I think this looks pretty crappy for a $3,200 bike. Uh, hoping they just go ahead and clean this up like this, basically take off two inches or so off the cable and call it done. And then on the bottom here are two USB ports. Uh, so those USB ports, you can go ahead and plug anything you want into, leave it up here, your tablet, whatever the case may be. Also on the fans, they are adjustable, so you can move them around, uh, up, down. I mean, it's, they're adjustable. They're, they're not too shabby in that respect. So I think we've now walked from the back of the bike to the front of the bike. Now let's go ahead and jump on the bike and talk a little bit more about some of the road feel stuff. Okay, so here we are ready to go ahead and jump on the bike. Uh, and I've got it set up right now with Zwift up there, but I haven't started Zwift yet and I'll explain why in just a quick second. Uh, and then I've got the display here already on, which means I just pedaled it like one crank resolution, revolution. Go ahead and just simply jump on. In this case, I've got some Pavero Asioma pedals on there. That way I can do power meter accuracy uh, testing and comparison. I've got all the accuracy data again down the review thing of a jig down below. Uh, so the first thing you're gonna notice now that I'm on the bike before I start Zwift uh, to search and pair for sensors is the display. You'll see right now, for example, there is the speed up there. I've got my wattage right there. The fans just ticked on right then. I'm gonna unplug them in a second, but we'll get to that. Beats per minute coming from my heart rate uh, chest strap right here. RPMs, if we go ahead and speed up a little bit, right there, and the gearing right there, as well as the incline. Incline is controlled by these little blue buttons on the insides right there. I can press that and you'll see it goes down, makes it easier to pedal, and the opposite direction to make it harder to pedal. Uh, now in this particular case, you'll see all this information here because we're not paired to an app yet. So once I go ahead and do that up here on the screen, okay, you'll see right there that all of it has been automatically found because I've already paired up the bike once before, but it's pretty easy to do. I just go in here and select controllable, for example, 
view to pair, choose the attack smart bike. This is all via Bluetooth smart. It's gonna pull in the controllable aspect of Bluetooth smart, as well as the power meter and the cadence and the chest strap. The heart rate there is coming from my chest strap. So I'm gonna go ahead and go down to let's go. And what you notice though is in the middle of that whole thing is a display right here, removed all the extra information. And now it shows me just gearing and my heart rate right there. Uh, so kind of just the basics now. Okay, so I'm immediately feeling the resistance now and the fans have turned on. You might be able to hear my microphone there. So I'm gonna pull them out in just a second. But before we get into that, I'm gonna do a quick sound test with the fans on and with the bike itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start off and then I'm gonna accelerate into a sprint. You can listen to things. I'm gonna switch over to the on-camera mic right now. So you can hear that you can hear how echoey it is in here. If I use just a lab mic, you won't hear really anything at all. So here we go. Okay, a quick second to catch my breath, we'll continue on. Okay, now that I'm all caught up, we're gonna walk through a couple things in the bike. Some of them you may have picked up on while I was actually riding. Uh, so the first one is a light that's coming on the flywheel down there and below the bike. This is tied to your wattage. So the low wattage like this, it's blue. Then it goes into purple. And then I throw it on a bit more wattage. It'll eventually get to red. You can see it right there. Uh, and of course, that'll just be there the entire time. It'd be really cool if apps could somehow control this. I'm not really sure what to do with that, but it might be kind of neat right now. It's just the same as the Neo series in the past uh, for the bottom light, and there's no particular control of that. The next thing you probably noticed was my shifting. So shifting is done on these little blue buttons right there. And what I do is I shift, you'll see on the display right here, it'll go ahead and shift. So if I go up, I chain link to an easier gear, it's instantaneous, like instantly. And if I go and I try to shift beyond that point, there's a little like double vibration coming from the bike, basically. Uh, and the same is true when I shift through the cassette, it just kind of bops each little bit of vibration. So it feels like you're shifting. Like you feel that momentary lift of weight, um, just like you would in a real derailleur. And it's a pretty cool effect. To go ahead and shift the uh, front side, the chain rings up there, I use my left hand side over here, the exact same buttons right there, and you'll see it shifts down instantly. And you can see my cadence just quickly as I go from the 50 to 34, it's like boom, just like it would be on a real bike. Like if you did that in real life, boom, you just transition down to easier gear and you kind of fly through it, so to speak. Now you also have brakes. These are right up here. If I squeeze these like this. And now what's gonna happen is when I squeeze these, it's gonna apply resistance to the flywheel and gonna go ahead and basically stop my pedaling. But you also notice the power will spike. So watch as I do this. So go ahead, I'm gonna try to pedal through it. And you can see my power spiking up, which is interestingly causing Zwift to go faster. Uh, and the reason for that is that even though I'm pulling the brakes like I would outside, in this case, it's actually increasing power and not actually decreasing speed. Because Zwift is tied to power and not speed, it's kind of a, a bit of a bug per se. It's not like a tax bike bug. It's more of a tax and tax and in trainer industry type bug that needs to be resolved. So what about road feel? It's pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and just accelerate a little bit right here. And no issues with that. The other thing too is that there's no issues with like the old Neo 1 series uh, and 2 as well, but not 2T, where you could basically sprint through something at low speeds and it would slip. That doesn't occur here. So as you saw there, I was low speed there, up a 4% incline and there's no slip. I just, boom, it carries it right through instantly. Super, super responsive. No issues at all there with uh, responsiveness on the unit itself until we talk erg mode. So what I've been at this point in time is sim mode or basically simulation mode. It simulates the gradients and that's what the majority of lift is until you're in a structured workout. And then you want what's called erg mode or workout mode. Uh, now in my case, I did most of my testing of erg mode in trainer road. Though the problem is exactly the same on Zwift as well. And the challenge is that the Neo bike over commits and basically it's too powerful for its software. So what happens in erg mode is you set a set point. In my case, I was doing 30 by 30s 
and I went at 400 watts and it would overshoot to be like 430 or 380 and it would oscillate through these intervals. So you weren't really hitting the wattage you wanted to, wasn't terribly ideal. In talking to tax about it, it is a problem they acknowledge. The same problem I saw in the Neo 2T where again, super strong internals, but the software was from the Neo 2, which didn't have those same strong internals and therefore didn't like know how to use the power it had and it, it overshot. Tax says they're fixing that. Expect a firmware update pretty soon that should resolve it. Now for that particular issue, that's more about stability. In other words, can it hold the wattage set point that you're telling it to, which is very different than accuracy. From an accuracy standpoint, things are pretty darn good here. They are usually within a couple watts of the pedals I put on there. Right now I've got the Vero Asiomos. I've also tried the Garmin Vector 3s as well as the PowerTap P2s on here. No issues for any of them. There is one little catch though, which is that that small washer that you put in between the pedal and the crank arm is a very thin metal and it does tend to impact the accuracy of the pedal based power meter itself, not the bike, your, your pedals because they're not expecting that little bit of flux. Tax again says they're going to go ahead and try to increase the thickness of that washer so that pedal based power meters in comparisons like I do aren't being impacted by that. The other item is downhill drive. Uh, so as I go down a hill, it should go ahead and actually spin the flywheel forward. So you can see downhill drive right here. I'm starting to go downhill, negative 3%, negative 4%, negative 5%. Now if I stop spinning, this should actually keep on going. So watch what happens. There you go, it's still spinning. So I'm going downhill, speed at 36, uh, and it feels like if I try to spin through this, it's harder to do because it's providing that forward momentum as you go down. And as I get to the bottom of the hill here, they'll flatten out. So watch what happens here on the incline. This just starts slowing down, just as it normally would. And now 6%, 7% up, and this is gonna stop as you hit the bottom there. Okay, I think that's everything there uh, that I can think of from a riding standpoint. Again, I've been riding this since like April or so, so I've got a pretty good deal on what works and, and doesn't work, and the vast majority of things I got right. Um, I'd give it like a solid A minus B plus category, somewhere in that range there, like a 89 to 92% if you were on 100, zero to 100% kind of grade. There's some things I wanna nitpick with, or I can nitpick and I have nitpick with um, throughout this review, as well as my written review. I think almost all those things are easily solvable either via firmware or via just small hardware tweaks, like the washer can fit in an envelope, they can send that out. That's kind of minor stuff like that. The cable length here is stuff they can fix in manufacturing pretty easily. Uh, so none of it's like showstopper by any stretch of the imagination, just little polished things that you would expect for a $3,200 bike. Um, speaking of expensive bikes, I'll be doing a full shootout between this bike, the Watt Bike Atom that the camera is precariously above right now, as well as the Wahoo bike, which the FedEx man is supposed to be delivering. Um, this is now day two of this filming, and he was supposed to be here eight hours ago, and he's got 24 minutes left. So we will see what happens. But uh, soon I'll have this bike, and uh, with that, I'll do a complete shootout. You know what a shootout is? I'm going to go through all three bikes, every possible spec you can think of, uh, and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the difference between them all. So if you found this interesting, go ahead and whack that like button at the bottom there or the subscribe button so you don't miss out on that shootout as well as my full Wahoo bike review once I've got a bunch of time on that, a bunch of rides and see how that rolls and everything else sports tech that's coming. It's still, it's still like fall. There's lots of things to come down the road here. Have a good one.